Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm here today again with special guest Dr. Jeanette Ramos, who is one of my awesome HemePath colleagues. Dr. Ramos, as many of you know, joined us here on the channel last year and did an amazing lecture on uh, non-neoplastic lymph nodes and how they stain. And since then, many people have asked for her to come back and teach more HemePath. And as you all know, I know very little about HemePath and I struggle with it. So um, I've asked Dr. Ramos to come here today and teach us about peripheral blood smears. And uh, hopefully I will learn something and all of you will as well. Um, Dr. Ramos, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, peripheral smears are sort of near and dear to my heart because when I was a post-sophomore fellow, this is when I was introduced to the heme world and uh, is what I did with my pathology mentor. Actually, when I continued on in years three and four in medical school, I think having a good understanding of peripheral smears is a good backbone uh, for getting in then into bone marrow aspirates and bone marrow okay. biopsies. So before you can actually evaluate the peripheral smear, the first thing you always do really with any specimen is check to make sure you have the correct patient name and specimen number. Right. And then you have to evaluate if the peripheral smear is satisfactory to review, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. The CBC has a plethora of information. And so knowing what the CBC can tell you can be very helpful in your evaluation. And that's complete blood count, right? Right. For anyone. We, we often forget sometimes and use a, a lot of abbreviations in medicine and forget at what level people know those abbreviations or not. And then, importantly, you need to know what the question your clinical colleagues are asking you. And so that's an also important for the clinical colleagues to tell us. For example, I had a peripheral smear once that came in with no information and I went looking into the note and the question was something I wouldn't normally address which is are there acanthocytes on the peripheral mm. smear and so that's important to know otherwise you may not get your question answered and then you can finally look at your smear under the microscope and write your interpretation so a good peripheral smear is has a film or where the, the film is with help the blood okay that goes two-thirds to three-fourths down the length of the slide. A smear that is too short is going to be problematic because it's going to be too thick. Mm. And especially if you're looking at Rouleau, in the thick part of the smear you have Rouleau-like artifact. So you won't be able to evaluate that. And of course that, you know, that's important for myeloma patients and such. So it's got to be spread just the right thickness and this is how you make sure that that's happened, huh? Right. Okay. The uh, film should have a slightly rounded edge without being a sharp bullet point. Okay. The lateral edges of the film should be visible, so it shouldn't have run off the slide, but it should go almost the entire width of the slide. And you should have a film that is smooth without interruptions or irregularities. And then this last one is a textbook thing that I really don't know exactly what they're talking about, but I put it in here for completeness, which is when you hold the slide up to the light, you should see a rainbow uh, appearance at the feathered edge. And it sounds really pretty, and I wish I really understood what they were saying, but uh, there, there are it many is. things like this in pathology where things are supposed to look a certain way, and in real life, uh, most of us mere mortals just shake our heads, right, and wonder, I don't get it, I don't see it. <laughs> right. So these are some examples of not good peripheral smears. Okay. So the one furthest on the left, uh, as you can see, definitely has an interruption hmm. right here. Uh, not quite sure exactly what happened there, but all of that then is, is gone. So the blood's missing it's there, It's missing right? there. Okay. This one is way too short and, and not wide enough. And we're not quite sure exactly why that was happening uh, because the tech that was doing this was actually a really good tech and she repeated it and the blood kept doing that multiple hmm. times. So it's also really important to talk to your techs and be like, hey, what happened here? Um, and see if there's an issue like that. We also had in, we've had issues where they were having trouble with the smears and the techs, you know, this blood is just really, really thick. Turned out the patient was hyperviscous. Oh. And it actually, you know, promoted more laboratory workup and then this is just poor staining yeah it's a very different color 
It's a very different color. I'm not sure what happened in the stainer, but that's also going to be suboptimal for interpretation. Great. All right, so your complete blood count. So I do have abbreviations here for a lot of things. So WBC is your total white blood count, and that is simply your total white blood count, the mm -hmm. number of white blood cells we have. Uh, your red blood cell count is so similarly your total red blood cell count. Your hemoglobin is grams of hemoglobin per deciliter, and that's going to be an okay value to have even if you have a hemolytic specimen because the machine actually hemolyzes to get there. Oh, hemoglobin. yeah. Uh, hematocrit, however, you have to have intact red blood cells. And that's the proportional volume of blood occupied by your erythrocytes. Your MCV is your mean red cell volume or how big your red cells are. So, if, you know, are they just right? Are they too small? Are they too big? Uh, microcytes or macrocytes. And then your mean cell hemoglobin is the amount of hemoglobin per red blood cell. And a lot of times that's going to correlate with uh, your chromasia. So are these hypochromatic red cells or is there too much white space in your red cells? But there's a problem with MCH because it's, it's the amount of hemoglobin per red blood cell. It doesn't take into consideration if your red cell is small or if it's big. So if right. you have a big red blood cell, you're going to have more hemoglobin in it. And you can get sort of erroneous numbers, which is why you have the mean cell hemoglobin concentration, which then takes into account your red cell size. Okay. So I would say use your MCHC over your MCH okay. when you're evaluating. Your RDW or your red cell distribu distribution width is basically your variation of red cell size. So s some people, well, you and I, probably have red cells that are about the same size. So your RDW is going to be in that normal-ish range. But if you have people who have really small ones and really big ones, then you're going to have an elevated RDW. Uh, and platelets here is basically, again, your total platelet count. Your MPV is the equivalent of your MCV for your platelets. So how big are your platelets? Oh, okay. And your platelet distribution width is the exact same thing as your red cell distribution width. Like, do you have all small ones? Do you have all big ones? Or a range. Or a range. Okay. Cool. And so the the CBC, what type of uh, the blood comes in a tube? The tube has a, I remember the color tops change, right? What color top are you supposed to do for CBC? Or does it matter? Uh, it's usually a lavender top. Okay. And, except in certain situations, which we'll talk about later. Okay. And then do you do the same tube of blood that's used for the CBC? Ideally, the, a, a drop or a few drops of that is taken and the smear is made from that? Yes. You're using the same sample to run your complete blood count and to make your, your smear for visual interpretation? Yes. Okay. And lavender is EDTA. EDTA is the, is the chemical in there. Okay, cool. Sure. All right. So I'm a big proponent, as you know from the lymph node lecture, if you listen to that, in that you don't know what abnormal is until you know what normal is. So this is a peripheral blood film from a pathology resident who donated her blood to some machine, uh, you know, control, uh -huh. and then got her own peripheral blood uh, as a thank you present. <laughs> so this is my peripheral blood. Cool. Um, and you can we have extra special specimens today. That's It's fun when it's your own sample, actually. That's how you know you're meant to be a pathologist, right? It is. And we should have, so Ooh. the circles are your leukocytes. And I know that this is low power. This is about at 200x, and we'll go higher in just a little bit. But those are your leukocytes. and just giving you a general gestalt of about how much leukocytes are normal and low power. And leukocytes, fancy name for white, white blood, blood cell, cells. right? So if you're, if you're a beginner there, that's, that's what we, we call them. And... And if you look really, really closely, you can see the itty-bitty platelets, which aren't actually cells. They're little fractions of megakaryocyte membranes. So just the tiny specks in the background, huh? And I promise you, I will give you higher power in just a second. And then, again, a low power, but you'll notice that that red blood cell looks a little bit different than the rest in the background. Yeah, looks like a little chunk or something. A it's little... a little fragment. Oh, okay. And so I just point that out in that I know I did not have TTP at the time. <laughs> I didn't have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So don't get too terribly upset if you see one or two fragments in your peripheral blood smear. If you start seeing 
you know, one or two per high power field, then you start getting upset and start making phone calls potentially depending on the clinical scenario. But that can happen in a normal individual, right? Is right. it just like maybe procedural or something or we don't know? It could be procedural. Um, I tend to be a hard stick, so I often end up getting butterfly needles, in which mm. case it, it could be procedural. Um, in real patients that have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, it could be a like a mechanical heart valve, for mm -hmm. instance, or, you know, yeah, there are other things, other right? Things. I think that's it's important in all of pathology, right, to know like what abnormal things are, but also when abnormal things don't necessarily mean a pathology for the patient, right? Don't mean the patient is sick, right? And sometimes that's the hardest job, right? Sorting out what's what's an artifact versus what's really something we need to worry about. Absolutely. So here is a higher power of our our my white blood cells <laughs> uh, or leukocytes. So beautiful. These are neutrophils. In the adults, they are the most common leukocyte. Uh, they have what I call baby girl pink granules, mm. and they're more subtle usually than your eosinophils and your base. So that's this background, the, this little fine granules here in the cytoplasm? Right, yes. And, and what power are we on here? Like what magnification? Is this under oil? This is under oil. This is at 1,000x. Thousand 1,000x. Thousand so that's why you can't, like when I see these on... Um, under my microscope, I don't have an oil lens. I look on a 40X, and e to me, white blood cells look a little pink, but you definitely can't see those granules. I can, at least my eyes can't. Or, and it's different in tissue, uh -huh. uh, H and E sections. Oh, good it point. Is on uh, peripheral films. Um, first of all, H and E sections are hematoxylin and eosin. And peripheral this is right stain. Right stain. Okay. So they look a little bit different. They look similar, but you'll notice if you go from bone marrow aspirates to your bone marrow biopsies, looking at the right to the H&E, you'll see some differences. The color different. The, okay, cool. The morphology. Uh, and they generally have, the neutrophils have three to five segments. Okay. If you have neutrophils that have uh, five segments and greater than 5% of your neutrophils or neutrophils that have more than five segments, those are considered to be hyper-segmented. Hyper-segmented. Neutrophils with less than three are considered to be Hypo segmented. Okay. But seeing five in just one cell doesn't necessarily mean there's some problem, right? No. It's only if it's uh, oh, more than 5%, you said, of the total. Right. Okay. And keep in mind, if you look at cytospin slides, that rule goes out the window because cytospin can artificially ah. give you segmentation. So this is a small mature lymphocyte. The nucleus is about the size of a red blood cell. You have a thin rim of blue cytoplasm. And in adults, it is the second most common leukocyte. In newborn children, it is the most common hmm. leukocyte. I didn't know that. And it switches somewhere in the aging process. This big guy is a monocyte. It has more of a blue-gray cytoplasm. The nucleus can be variably shaped. Sometimes you'll have a nucleus that looks very much band-shaped and your text will have a lot of problems with that. So make sure you look at your cytoplasm. It can be very, very helpful. And a band, is that an immature or a, a left-shifted neutrophil or no? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> it's always so, more complicated than I think. <laughs> so the technical term for neutrophil that we see here is segmented neutrophil. Okay. The technical term for band is band neutrophil. Okay. So bands are technically also neutrophils. So it is true that if you have increased bands, so quote-unquote bandemia, that that can be considered to be a left shift. But okay. if you have a few bands here and there, that's, that's fine, totally huh? fine. When you get back a little bit more immature into the metamylocytes, I'm, if I see even one meta, I'm going to say either rare left shifted grands are present or say like mild left okay. shifted granulocytes. But the point is a band, band neutrophil can look a lot like a monocyte, right? That's right. Okay. And so the main difference between a band neutrophil and a segmented neutrophil is that it, it basically is smooth all the way through. There are no segments. Oh, okay. And then monocytes often will have vacuoles hmm. in the cytoplasm. And that can be a real help, in, especially if you have a reactive appearing lymphocyte, which I'll show you later, versus a monocyte. So reactive lymphocytes can sometimes have vacuoles, but most of the time the vacuoles are very reassuring that you know you're looking at your monocyte. Okay. 
But the chromatin pattern is how eventually you train your eyes to determine whether it's a reactive lymphocyte or a monocyte. Eosinophils are my favorite. They're mm -hmm. probably the easiest to identify. They have very chunky, hot pink granules. Um, am I allowed to say that I call them Barbie pink, or I is that trademarked? You, I think you can say. Okay. I think you can say. I call pink. them Barbie pink because if you, I'm going to age myself now. Back when I played with Barbies, everything Barbie owned was like this color pink. <laughs> her car, her house, her dresses, and now Barbie is is branching out a little uh -huh. bit more, but I call this one baby girl pink, that, you know, soft pink, uh -huh. and this Barbie pink. So the color's a little different, and the granules here are bigger and chunkier they're than chunkier, in They're chunkier, and they're even refractile if you're looking under light microscopy. Yeah, on, on H&E, I find that really helpful because I feel like the color of neutrophils and um, EOs can be somewhat similar on H&E, at least from low power, and I feel that oftentimes my residents will say, oh, I think they're EOs, and it's just uh, neutrophils, like in, in a derm path biopsy. But I find that if I flip my condenser, I can get that refractile look, and you can really see the granules on the EO, but again, I can't on 40X see them on the neutrophil, and I find that actually helpful in practice in tissue sections to tell them apart. And then this guy here is a basophil. Now, I find basophils to be the most morphologically variable of all the uh, white blood cells circulating. Because if you look at a basophil cross-eyed, it will degranulate. <laughs> which is kind of what this one has done. Most of this is degranulated. And I'll show you one later uh, that's not. But you can still see that chunky uh, purple granular. These are the least common uh, white blood cell. And, in fact, is the only basophil on my entire peripheral. Let's wow. Smear, which is why that is the example and not a better granulator. You have low basophil count. I think it must be something something serious. I'm just joking. Yeah. The what you know what I did, I've always wondered why don't we see basophils in tissue sections? Like I've never recognized the basophil in skin or anywhere else. Are they there and they just don't look like or do they only stay in the blood and never get out into the tissue? Is there I, any? I don't know. I've always wondered why is this thing that's in our blood never show up, or at least I can never see it. I well, they're so rare even in the blood. Okay. Um, I don't think you're really going to to pick them up. They may not stain well on H and E. I oh, don't okay. know because I've never actually really looked for them. All that yeah. much. They're not prominent in the bone marrow either. Okay. Um, and then. Some people consider basophils and mast cells to be kind of cousins. That's what I wondered if they are like mast cells, but we see lots of mast cells in the skin, way more than you would see in the blood. So. Right. Um, some people don't consider them to be related. Uh. It's it's sort of up in the air. I, they're not the same cell. Okay. They're they are the, different cells. They are de different cells. They look pretty similar. They have that clumpy uh, purple granules. Mm -hmm. Uh, basophils should have this sort of bilobed appearance okay. to them. Yeah. So you can see there's two And mast here. cells don't have that. And mast cells, normal mast cells, should have a centrally placed mm -hmm. nucleus that you can barely see because it has so many granules. Okay, that's cool. That's good to know. Uh, I, the only time I really see basos probably is in CML. Okay. And this is... A picture to highlight the red blood cells. So the red blood cell in three dimensions is a biconcave disc, which basically means that it comes together in the middle. So it's fatter on the outside and thinner on the inside, okay. which makes it look like a donut Yeah. on the peripheral mm, blood film. Donuts. So there you go. You now have your first pathology food analogy for this session, and it should be about a third. So if you have an increased, um, you know, pallor, that would be sort of your like clue. Should I look for iron deficiency? Okay. Or so the, the the clear the clear part in the middle you're saying should be about a third of the space across the whole red cell. Right. Okay. And that clear part's not really a hole, right? It's it's really connected. It's just that the section we're seeing it looks like a. Right. Empty space. Yeah, it's, okay. It's not really an empty space. There, I mean, the red it's just cell. It's a dip, right? It's, it's a dip. Okay. Yes. It's important to have that so your your red blood cell can fit through like all the capillaries ah, and gold and stuff. Cool. And there are platelets that you can actually see. Uh, there nice. is a little bitty platelet aggregate there, and you know individual platelets here. 
little bitty aggregates like this, if they're few and far between, I don't really mention. Okay. Because it's not really going to affect the platelet count. But larger ones will, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. But now you can see them. They're granular. And they, if you look at the megakaryocytes, it looks like megakaryocyte granules. Okay. And in the bigger megakaryocyte, I feel like those granules sort of look like the texture of a furry purple muppet. <laughs> Uh, and it's so your platelet should look a little bit furry. Okay. All right. So this is now our first non-me example. <laughs> I would not be feeling very well if this was me. Uh -huh. So first of all, look at about the white space you see in my peripheral smear. And I run with the hemoglobin around 14. Okay. You mean the white space between red cells, Between huh? okay. red cells. So a lot lower here. They're a really lot spaced lower out. There. They're really, really spaced out. And you'll notice that there are some red blood cells that have that donut-like appearance, but there are some that have lost their central pallor completely. Yeah, just a round ball, basically. They're little huh? round balls, and I've sort of highlighted some of them. So this hemoglobin is 7.7, .7, so it's low. And what's the what's the lower end of the normal range? Well, that depends. Okay. It, it depends if you're, what age you are, mm -hmm. and it depends if you're male or female. Okay. Uh, so the lower end of normal for an adult male is... Uh, and it well, de depends from lab to lab, too, right? It to also, some degree. Yes, mm -hmm. it does. Um, but 12-ish, something in that 12 range? Yeah. The so seven's pretty under, low. The male uh, hemoglobin is about a gram higher than female. Oh, okay. And so, yeah, so 7.7 .7 is going to be low. It's not quite at transfusion low yet. Okay. That's usually below 7, or if you have, um, like, coronary artery disease and are symptomatic, they uh -huh. want to give you some. So all the black arrows are pointing to those cells I described that had lost their central pallor, and... Um, are those spherocytes? Those are spherocytes. Because they're a sphere? Okay, yeah. cool. And the blue one, if you look really, really closely, you can see some fine basophilic skin. Yeah, it has is, little dots. Which is why it got its own little special color. <laughs> so uh, this patient doesn't have a history of hereditary spherocytosis. Okay. And if she did, I would expect pretty much all of them to look like spherocytes. Um, so this is probably going to be an autoimmune type hemolysis. And... Um, that, I mean, that's probably what this is. But And is that like the you get antibodies attached to the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, and then the spleen, spleen pulls off little bits of membrane and it makes them lose membranes so they turn instead of a biconcave disc into a sphere? Right, because it's I the vaguely same remember this from yeah, med school. It's, it's, a long it's sort time. of like the fluid kind of stays about the same and you're taking away your membrane. Uh -huh. So then it turns them into spheres and then they can't bend through the capillaries. Uh -huh. So they lice. Break and rupture and lice. And, and then that's you, bad. Yeah. Okay. And then you don't have functioning red cells uh -huh. anymore. Okay. Uh, so in hereditary spherocytosis, where all the red blood cells are spheres, a lot of patients end up getting splenectomies uh -huh. to help with the whole To process. avoid that problem. Okay. Um, that and their spleens get rather large, trying to take out all the spherocytes. So oh, okay. Uh, they, hereditary spherocytosis is a chronic hereditary, or a chronic hemolytic, hemolytic condition. And so you're going to still get hemolysis because you're not taking out all your capillaries. I mean, you need those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at least your spleen isn't, like, holding on to them yeah. anymore. And I always have problems remembering, like, which mutation is more common in hereditary spherocytosis versus hereditary elliptocytosis. And it's ancrin for spherocytosis, and it's spectrin for elliptocytosis. So the S's don't stay together. Ah, uh, yeah. I always have to use unusual tricks like that to help me remember uh, things I get confused a lot. And or look that up five minutes before you take the test and then forget. <laughs> uh. That's what I do with the coag cascade and complement. I can't ever remember it. I have to look it up before every exam. I can yeah. never get the stick. So for this, you'd probably check a DAT to see if your DAT was positive. And DAT is uh, like a Coombs test, right? Right. Basically. So it's checking to see if there's antibodies on the red cells? Right. Okay, cool. This was a very interesting case that we had. So you'll notice that there are red cells and a few platelets, but like no white cells in this picture at all. 
Yeah. And it turns out this patient actually came to us for pancytopenia, and she was in almost 70 years old. Had no real medical history of anything. Uh, no history of anemia, no nothing. And it turns out her pancytopenia spontaneously resolved. So it was probably actually hmm. a viral insult. But Interesting. it prompted this whole workup for MDS. And it turns out she actually had all her life hereditary elliptocytosis and never knew it. Never knew. So unlike hereditary spherocytosis where you have all these problems with hemolysis, you don't generally get that with hereditary elliptocytosis. So you could have it your whole life and be asymptomatic, basically. And Often. Then, until someone happens to look at your blood and say, oh, look, they're all ovals. Yeah. And that happens often. Now, I'm not saying that happens all the time, because some patients do have problems mm -hmm. with hemolysis, but a lot of times it presents sort of like this. And then the black arrow is pointing not at an elliptocyte, which are these guys here. Those are elliptocytes. Okay. But what's, yeah, what's but the spiky that, guy? Exactly. Uh, it's... Also called a burr cell. Ah, okay. Or an echinocyte. Oh, like a hedgehog, like right? Like a hedgehog, spiky... yes. And it was that on the last slide too. The last I thought I saw spiky cells Probably. there. Probably the same. And and I'll tell you why, because often when we get these slides made for our study sets, they've sat for a few hours. Oh. And echinocyte change happens as the red cells sit, and uh and or other processes such as uremia and this patient did not have uremia okay so Most, sometimes they're real and sometimes they're artifact but the so you have to look at the whole clinical picture to make whole, see which makes sense when i'm seeing a lot of echinocytes i always check the chemistry and okay if the bun creatinine is high then i will specifically comment on that okay perfect. if i know that this is an add-on order and the bun creatinine is normal um i may or may not comment on them depending on how they are. So I'm just going to interject here. This is an awesome example of how pathology, although we do a lot of looking at pictures and images and microscopic uh, findings, we're doctors. We have to put together the whole picture, the clinical, the other lab work, see if what we're seeing makes sense and interpret it with that lens, right? We, we're not just like saying, oh, here's the findings. Good luck uh, to our clinical team. We, we work with them and with the, all of the aspects of what the patient has to try to figure out what makes the most sense of what's going on, right? Right. And it's that, that kind of problem solving, some days it's maddening because it's hard, but it also is cool when you find a find an answer that makes sense and you can actually make a difference for a patient. I, those are moments I really like at least. So, Some of the times you get the most words from me when I have absolutely no clinical history. I th yes, <laughs> me too. Because I don't know what's going on. So you get a lot of, like it could be all of this umbrella thing I don't, know anything so you're going to have to go back to the patient and figure out so dear clinical colleagues who are watching this please help your pathologists out help us help you tell us clinical information about the patient because we are we are able to often give you more information back when we know more about what's going on um and that's that's everyone wins right i've encountered and i'm sure you have too bias where the clinical colleagues think they're going to to bias us and <laughs> what we're going to say if they give us pertinent information and that's really not true we're yeah better able to help if we have more yeah and we we train to to work around that right i actually always try to look at slides first without seeing see what i what i see and without knowing any clinical then i look at the clinical afterwards and see does it make sense what i saw microscopically and then what the clinical situation is and if it does that's great if it doesn't then i go and rethink the situation so it's good hmm. so what do you think of those red blood cells Mm, they are strange shapes. Like this little one looks like a mouse or something. See his little ears, his little tail, tiny little foot. Okay, maybe I've been looking at slides too long. I mean, those are normal-ish, I normal. think. This is uh, like, you know, that's like Italy or something. I don't know. They're very irregularly shaped. And then these are platelets, right? Those are platelets. Are they bigger than usual or is that is that okay? They're slightly bigger than usual, but in order to call a giant platelet, it has to be the size of a red cell. So I will point out that there are some elliptocytes and ovalocytes on the slide. And this is actually a patient who had a history of hereditary elliptocytosis that developed hereditary pyropoikilocytosis after his he got a transplant. Pyropoikilocytosis. Pyropoikilocytosis. So pyro like the flame. Okay. Um, so the red cells become um, stable at higher temperatures and oh. fragment. So you will see also some spherocytes here. Yeah. And it's actually the opposite 
of what really happens with pyrrhopoikilocytosis because normally you have pyrrhopoikilocytosis in the pediatric population and they will sometimes grow out of it and develop hereditary elliptocytosis. Huh. And he eventually cleared this again, but it was sort of a clinical mystery as to like how. And I think that they call it that because it almost resembles this picture. They're not quite as funny looking. Okay. But this is what you see in a burn patient. Oh. But these are very, very, very small microcytes. And they're not, these are the spherocytes. See how they have no central pallor? And they're darker color, right? Because the hemoglobin's color. all bunched up together, I guess. And see, the central pallor remains here. So they're not oh, fragments. Yeah. They're just really, really small microcytes. Huh. And that is one of those, like, they put this picture up and they would expect you to know that this is a burn picture. Okay. A burn patient. So those are microcytes. So micro... Like micro microcytes. Micro microcytes. Not even like iron deficiency micro or thalassemia microcytes. They're smaller so than that. Small. So, so little, small. So little little tiny donuts. And then also having spherocytes, does that go along with burn too? Yes. Okay. Interesting. So I'd expect the RDW on this patient to be quite high. Because you've got tiny and big and everything in between, right? It's right. a range. Okay. Although these little tiny ones may get counted as platelets. Because they're so small, red yeah. Red blood cells. So you might have to adjust your platelet count. Okay. And this is a different red blood cell morphology. Some of those look kind of like a kinocytes to me. Like they're... Well, these are. Okay, those are. They're these are. And, and spiky guys. I yeah. like those. And again, this is because I definitely went back to my text and said, please make me a slide for my study set. Oh, and so it had been sitting. I see. So okay. it had been sitting, but these are where your eyes should go. Okay. So these are called blister cells. I was going to say, they've got like a little bleb, a little blob mm -hmm. that's clear coming out the end. Okay, cool. And does blister cell dredge up anything from the re recesses of your... It should because I just retweeted something just the other day that someone posted of a smear with little blister cells and they said it was due to exposure to, to something, but I can't... I guess I didn't pay enough attention when I retweeted because it didn't stick in my memory, but they, I thought, ooh, those are cool looking. I can't remember. What is it? They're, they're not specific for... Because it can be seen in other things, but you really should check your patient for G6PD deficiency. Oh, Okay. Which is what this is. Okay, G6PD deficiency. And then you also have a little basophilic stip. I was going to say there's little cell. blue dots there. Okay, And you cool. can also see that this red cell is a little bit more purple uh -huh. than its neighbors. Yeah. And that's what we mean by when, when we say polychromasia. Oh. Now, if you stained it with a super vital stain, a special stain, you could call it a reticulocyte, but you can't unless you do that special oh, stain. Oh, okay. So we say polychromasia. So it's sort of a synonym for, we can't call it a reticulocyte, but that's pretty much right. So this is a patient that has iron deficiency. It's not the best iron deficiency slide, because I'd really like to have more of these target cells or podocytes. Okay. But what you can see is that they're smaller than what we've been seeing. Uh -huh. And that's more like two-thirds of the middle and one-third of the actual donut. So, so the got, hole in the donut is bigger than it should be, right? And the right. ring is smaller. Okay. And so unless you were on a diet, you'd be really upset if you got that donut from the <laughs> shop um, instead of some of the other ones. And there's more white space between the red cells here, right? Right. Which tells us there's fewer red cells. All right. So this is iron deficiency anemia. Right. Um, and your big sort of differential diagnosis is going to be your thalassemia. Okay. And so there's this thing called the Metzner index that you can do. I don't tend to use that as much. It's it's a division of uh, the MCV by the red blood cell count. Oh, okay. I tend to look at more of the, are my rule of threes being uh, obeyed or not? So in iron deficiency, your rule of threes are obeyed. And you're going to ask me now, what is your rule of yeah, threes? Yeah, I was just going to say, did you say that? Because I forgot. No. Rule of threes. Okay. So rule of threes. So the hemoglobin should be about three times your white blood cell count. Oh, okay. And your hematocrit should be three times your hemoglobin. That sounds pretty pretty cool. Okay. It is. I don't, I don't know if I ever knew that, but if I did, I've forgotten it. And so in iron deficiency, you should expect a drop in your red cell count along with your hemoglobin and hematocrit. And oftentimes, in thalassemia, you actually have a normal to increase red blood cell count. Oh, okay. So I use that. And on tests, on tests, your RDW is going to be very helpful because you would expect to have an increased RDW in iron deficiency and a more normal RDW in thalassemia. Okay. In real life, throw that out the window. <laughs>
Uh, because, yes, you often do have an increased RDW in, in iron deficiency, but I've also not uncommonly seen increased RDWs with thalassemic patients. And hmm. then you also get into, well, thalassemic patients can also get iron deficiency. Oh, you could have both. You could have both. Uh, so you just want to be careful. Okay. So this is actually uh, thalassemia, and it's not alpha or beta. This is actually uh, Lepore, Lepore Baltimore, which is a delta delta beta thalassemia. Uh, it looks the same. It's still microcytic. You have a lot of these target cells. The other name for target cell is codocyte. Don't miss a test question because you don't know the other name. Like, yeah. <laughs> always know the variable, variant names for things, right? And you never this know. target cell, for whatever reason, it's has, a double target, has, huh? has a double target. Yeah. So if you think about like structurally what is happening there in order to see a target cell, instead of your, you have like a bulge in your in the middle of your biconcave disc to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of a lot of target cells, but you often see a lot of target cells in iron deficiency. So, so both thalassemia and iron deficiency can have it. Okay. It's not gonna not gonna really help. But if you've been treating a patient with iron deficiency or your iron uh, panel comes back is not iron deficiency and they've had persistent microcytic hypochromic anemia for their entire lifetime, you really should be thinking about thalassemia or something along that lines. Uh, if they've had a history of normal like normal you know, hemoglobin, all those values, then it's probably something acquired versus something. Oh, if it's been normal before, and yeah, right. that doesn't make sense. Because thalassemias are like genetically inherited, right? And they're right. hemoglobin -opathies. So if Or well, some, something's wrong with the hemoglobin? So I consider hemoglobinopathies to be um, st sort of structural aberrations that causes misfoldings. And oh. thalassemias to be um, quantitative oh, deficiencies. Okay. Sort of. So when you have an alpha thalassemia, you're missing alpha chain. When okay. you have a beta thalassemia, you're missing beta chain. Oh, the I see. The port is a little bit weird because it it's not that you're sort of missing your beta chain. It's that your beta chain and your delta chain are like one chain uh, because of how oh. the mutation happens. And then to test for thalassemia, you do a hemoglobin electrophoresis, though? Is that one of the ways you yes work them up? Yes and no. Oh, okay. Okay. So... Sorry, I'm leading you way off the path. That's I, okay. I... I like this. So hemoglobin electrophoresis can be helpful for beta thalassemia trait. Oh, okay. If you don't have concomitant iron deficiency. Okay. So if you have iron deficiency, it will artificially decrease your hemoglobin A2. And in beta thal trait, what you're looking for is an elevated hemoglobin A2. So if you have both of them together, you might have an abnormally oh, normal okay. hemoglobin A2, and you might miss it, which is why we say you can't really do hemoglobin electrophoresis for this if the patient is iron deficient. Treat the iron deficiency first and then come back. So um, this sounds like a whole entire topic for, a, for another video. <laughs> <laughs> so alpha thalassemia, what you're looking for would be like hemoglobin H and Bart's. And with some of the newer techniques, yeah, you can maybe pick those up, but at least on the gels, you would run right off the gels. Oh, okay. So honestly, your better test for alpha thalassemia is going to be molecular PCR. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, wait, is this a hyper segmented neutrophil? It's way hyper segmented. It's got like, what, 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9, maybe something. A lot. Some, a lot. More than 5. Very much more than five. And I will tell you that the MCV on this patient was quite high, probably okay. about um, 112, and it really should be under 100. So this is a macrocytic anemia to contrast with your microcytic anemia. Okay. And we have target. Are these target cells here? The, they are still target cells. Right, here? right. So also the point of target cells are not really specific to anything. Uh -huh. You can also see it in uh, liver problems and other okay. things which he might, may or may not have had. I so don't remember. hyper segmented neutrophil and then a macrocytic anemia. I want to say, is this B12 deficiency that gives you that? It can, but that's not what this is. Oh, okay. This is folate deficiency. Folate. Oh, that's right. I knew there was something else too, but I couldn't remember. So in the grand scheme of things, which is more common, folate deficiency or vitamin B12 deficiency? I think folate, right? Folate. Why? Because B12, I, I seem to remember that B12 stays around for a while. And right. It's, it's got a longer half. Yeah. So folate. you got to really be, you got to be like hardcore vegan or something, right? And like not eating, no offense to any vegans watching, but if you're not, 
if you're not eating any meat products, right? Isn't that where you get B12, something like that? Something like that. And I, I know there are a lot of um, vegans who are very uh, educated and know how to supplement yeah. correctly. Um, but it's so... Yeah, most vegans I know know a lot more about food than I do, probably. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. So this is folate deficiency. Okay. Folate deficiency. Cool. Hmm. Oh, is this a uh, the the nucleus retained? How will how will Jolie? No, clearly not. How will Jolie is the word you're, you're looking for, but that's not what this is. Okay, that's just a frank nucleated red cell. A but nucleated it's red cell. Okay. Atypical, because it's not nice and round. It's got yeah, this, like a little blob coming off to the, the yeah. side here, right? Yeah, it almost looks like one of those Star Wars droids, right? <laughs> it does. It also has a little bit of basophilic stippling. Okay. That red cell shape. A kind of a teardrop or pear shape, maybe? Teardrop, right. Teardrop. The other name for it is either dacrocyte or dacreocyte. Oh, so I that the Y is sort of optional. I like the Y, and so I make Epic learn it every time I do <laughs> it. Dacreocyte. Because it has the word cry in it, and yeah, that and teardrop the and cry. Dacreocyte. Like yeah. Dacreocyte. That's nice. I like it. And then there's some nice poly. So they're a little more bluish purple right. as opposed to the red of the other red cells. Okay. So the dacreocytes, what you'd be wondering about is, is there an infiltrative or fibrotic process in the bone marrow? Oh, so they're like getting squeezed out of the bone marrow and it, that's the way I, I that's, in my mind I visualize that's it, That's right? what I've always been told is that, yeah, it sort of like squeezes out and so then you have the pinpoint at the like last part that like uh -huh. came out. I'm not sure. Even if it's not true, it's a nice story to tell ourselves to remember, right? Exactly. Ooh, and those are sickles, right? Right. And how do those differ from the teardrop cells we saw before? I'd say pointy on both ends. Exactly. And that's the technical definition, is that the dacreocyte is pointed on one end, bulbous on the other, and the sickle cell is pointed at both ends. Okay, cool. And so this is sickle cell anemia. And look who's here. Targets again, huh? Targets again. All right. Hmm. No, those are the purple... You've got two arrows. So the blue arrow oh, yeah. is your Pappenheimer bodies. Which, Pappenheimer. Which are iron. That's iron. Okay. And then those are your Howell Jolly bodies. See uh, how they differ from your nuclear Dark body? purple, right? So and they, they're little. Yeah, they're little. They're nuclear remnants. So they're nucleated. the nucleated red cell left a little piece of itself behind. Okay. And you often see those in patients that have splenectomy. Now, in your sickle patients, sickle adult patients... Almost all of them have either had either surgical splenectomy or they've had a lot of infarcts and sort of given themselves an auto splenectomy. And you'll see these findings. And you can see that there are sickles here. This right is there, sickle. yeah. And then what about that arrow? Um, I assume that was like a platelet sitting on top of a red cell, but maybe not. I don't know. There's a little circle around it, like a little halo. And that's exactly right. So this is a trap. Uh, there are often test questions of what is this, and they'll give you how jolly body, Pappenheimer body, microorganisms, and you, this is just an overlying platelet. Because it's got that same kind of uh, furry look, right, as the yeah, kind exactly. of like blue and purple together. Okay, but wait, now this up here is that a maybe a how jolly or maybe not? Yeah, that's probably a how jolly body because this is also a sickle, a sickle right? Okay, okay, cool. And again, target cells. Okay. The black arrow looks like a sickle again. Mm -hmm. And the blue, I thought maybe it was, I couldn't tell if it was like a, a blister there, but it doesn't look quite like those other blisters you showed. Kind of, this one's kind of irregular shaped. I'm not sure what those are. So those are either called SC crystals or SC cells. Okay. So this patient has hemoglobin SC disease instead oh. of hemoglobin, you know, SS sickle disease. So it's a combination of hemoglobin C and hemoglobin S together. And hemoglobin SC makes these irregular crystals. Okay. Now, I don't have a picture of hemoglobin C. That's fine. Unfortunately. But hemoglobin C has nice, pretty tetragonal crystals. And 
that you should Google and look at because that is one of the also those pictures that they put on and expect you to know the diagnosis based okay. on what it looks so like. So there's crystal inside the cell and that's what's making the cell distort its shape? Yeah, it distorts. And and again, in hemoglobin C, it's a nice crystal. And people that have, patients that have SC, they still will get some sickled cells as well? Right, but not normally as many. Okay. Like you're normally hunting for them. Okay. They can still get sickle crises. Okay. Um, and then this is a platelet on top of a red cell, right? Yes. Another trick, okay. Another trick. Hmm. It like little blobs or fragments of red cell? Right, and what's the other name for fragment? Oh, um, I, I can't remember. <laughs> A -A oh, schistocyte. schistocyte. Yes, of course. Yeah, schistocyte. schistocyte. Schistocyte are the two fragments. Now, you know this patient also Hal. has a splenectomy yeah. because there's a hal jolly body. And is this polychromasia, slightly bluish? Okay, I'm slowly which, learning heme path. Okay. Which you honestly expect to sort of see in splenectomy. Okay. Patients, um, because the spleen isn't like taking out as much as, well, isn't taking out anything because it's gone. Uh -huh. uh, the spleen actually is a very highly functional, so in splenectomy, I expect to see some target cells. I probably will expect to see some nucleated reds. If this patient is at all stressed, I expect to see the Haldrali, the Pappenheimer bodies. This patient also happened to have at least three fragments in a high power field. So those are the ones where you're like thinking, oh, I need to start counting high power field fragments. So this means that the cells are being sheared and torn apart in in within the blood system somewhere right in within circulation so and so this is either your microangiopathic hemolytic anemia this it might just be uh the spleen is it clearing them out oh okay uh because you know i have a spleen and i have some fragments and my spleen will mop them up so we all have some breakdown of our red cells but normally they just get taken out by right. the spleen but if you have little clots or something like in microangiopathic then that Causes the red cells to tear apart in circulation, right. I guess. Or a mechanical heart, heart valve, valve or okay. DIC, or uh -huh. any any of those sort of circumstances. So now I'm counting. Now often in your true microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, you're like ten or more for high power. Bunch, yeah. It's not subtle. Okay. However, there are cases that have like none. You have true hemolytic anemia and you don't have serocytes and you don't have schistocytes, and I can't really tell you. Why? Is this a time where chemistry would help, though? Because if you have a hemolytic anemia, your bilirubin will go up, right? The... And your haptoglobin will go down. Oh, okay. So haptoglobin is something that I, I use. Because LDH isn't, will also go up, oh, but it right. isn't specific to red cells. Right. It's any lysing cell any lysing will release cell. LDH. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have a decreased haptoglobin and you have an increased bilirubin, you have an increased um, LDH, like all that goes together with, oh, we have hemolysis somewhere. But sometimes a peripheral smear will look red cell morphology normal, huh. and you don't really know why. Interesting. Those are frustrating. <laughs> it's your pathologist gets really frustrated when they can't put the puzzle together. Yeah, when you know, things when you, don't work the way they're supposed to. When you're to, putting right? together a puzzle and like the last piece is a hole because they didn't give it to you in the box. <laughs> All right. So they the red cells seem to clump together there a little bit. I don't know if that means that they're like almost molding. But I don't know if that's real or an artifact. So that's real. Okay. That's why I took the picture. And there seem like there are more platelets than in the other ones we saw, but I don't know if that means anything or not. I think that's probably more normal, and the other ones were probably more low. Low. Maybe. Okay. Uh, so these are cold agglutinins because oh. the red cells are agglutinating, and the, your lab or my lab has a warming procedure that they will use. So they'll give me this slide pre-warmed, and they'll give me a slide post-warmed. And you would expect to see the agglutination Go resolve, and, or mostly resolve with the warmed specimen, and then you feel pretty good about this is probably cold. And what does it mean? I've it's a it's a I remember it's, learning this in blood banking, but it's been so long. It's antibody mediated. Okay. And when the you get cold, exposed to cold, it agglutinates. Okay. Like that. Interesting. Yeah. It body does weird things. Hmm. So now we're not looking at red cells, we're looking at the leukocytes. White cells. So All white right. Cells. So I see granules there. Um, I can't tell if it's bilobed or like kind of a U shape. So that's probably more of a band. A than, band, okay. So that would be that would be what a band would look like. We talked about a band okay. earlier, and I said imagine that the segments are gone. So the segments are gone. That's that's a band. So, so a hypo segmented neutrophil, basically. No, that's totally different. Is it really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I'm glad I asked then. Hypo segmented, and I'll show you a picture in just a little bit, means that there are literally less than the normal number of segments. This is just a little bit younger and hasn't segmented. Oh, yet. okay, I see. Uh, and they mean totally different things. Okay. Uh, so this is a man neutrophil, but do you see how it's not quite that same sandy baby girl paint? Yeah, I felt like the granules are a little different color and a little bit... More prominent. Slightly bigger, yeah, uh -huh, not as fine. Right, so this is called toxic granulation. Oh. And this happens to be growth factor induced. Oh. But it could look the same with sepsis. So like maybe a growth factor meaning like someone's had a transplant, a uh, marrow transplant or something and they're giving them growth factor to regrow? Uh, it means that the white count is low. Oh, and okay. That can either be... be or they're getting an auto transplant and they are harvesting CD34 positive cells. Oh, so from they've the given them a. So they've given them a stimulus for their their granule size. Um, sometimes in MDS you'll get given it. Sometimes after chemo they'll need a little boost with the, mm -hmm. especially if you end up with like a neutropenic sort of fever and you okay. trying to get your granule sites back. Um, but the 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 marrow is being stimulated being to produce to produce more neutrophils, basically. Right. Yeah. And that so that's either endogenous, your body's making it because of the well, condition, this, or you're getting a medication. No, no, this is medication. Oh, medication caused it. Okay. Yeah, this is the growth factor of the medication. Okay. Cool. Uh, sepsis can also look like this, like your you know your body is revved up fighting usually you know bacteria, so it's sort of a reactive change, so. This here is your hyposegmented oh, neutrophil. So it still has a segment. It's just like two of, just two of them, right? Okay. Right. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I'll we'll start here. So this is hypogranular. So instead of having that prominent granulation mm -hmm. that we saw, this is just, it's lost all of them. Yeah. And that's a dyspoetic feature. And dyspoetic means like potentially myelodysplastic syndrome. I mean, not necessarily, but but that's one time where you could get dyspoesis. That's tr It just means that it's... It's an abnormality. Okay. Um, and so... We, it's not we, instead growing of, the right instead way. Instead saying dysplastic, uh -huh. I'm saying dyspoetic, meaning that there is a problem in the formation of this. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so poesis, granulopoesis means, you know, the formation of granulocytes, erythropoiesis, the maturation of erythrocytes. Oh, and so dyspoesis means it's not forming the right way. It's not forming the right way. Okay. And so this is also hypogranular, but is hyposegmented. Uh, that's a pseudo Pelgerhuit cell. Oh, I remember hearing about that a long time ago. Right. So this is important for sort of like test purposes. So Pelgerhuit anomaly is supposedly the most common like neutrophil anomaly. I've never seen it in real life <laughs> ever. I've never seen real Pelgerhuit disease. Uh, there are two types of Pelgerhuit disease. There's heterozygous, which is a lot more common, which I've also never seen, and homozygous, which I expect to never see. Uh, heterozygous Pelgerhuit anomaly has neutrophils with two segments. Homozygous will have one. Okay. Heterozygous, you're pretty much normal, except you have neutrophils and have two. But you don't have any symptoms, basically, from it. Not okay. really. If you're homozygous, though, you do. You okay. have, like, some bone abnormalities and other sequelae that come along with being homozygous. Okay. But Honestly, I feel like you have to be really, really unlucky because, again, I've never seen it. So having two parents to have something so Yeah, so I've, homozygous, you have to have two carriers have a baby, right? And right. And then 20, you have a 25% chance, chance that you'll right. both get the bad gene, the gene, yeah. Right, and it will have one. And so what you'll what you'll have to really watch is that you don't call them all myelocytes. Because they'll have one nucleus right. and it'll look like a, okay. Right. Um, so... On test questions, a lot of the time they'll give you percentages of the cells that are hyposegmented. So in true Pelger anomaly, you would expect like most of them to have it. So really you should be looking for greater than 50% and really greater than 80% of them should be hyposegmented. Okay. If you have like 20%, 10% of them, that's probably MDS or some sort of chemotherapy type um, artifact. And MDS is myelodysplastic, myelodysplastic syndrome. syndrome. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Well, there's a blue, a pretty blue color blob in that. I think that's a neutrophil. It's got kind of funny shaped segments, but I don't know what it means. And this is a cellivision picture. Cellivision. Um, not the same patient, but a similar patient. And Almost like a crystal or something, huh? Like it's... 
I don't know, kind of jagged at the edges, that blue. I don't know. I give up. So you've probably never heard of these. Ones. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Um, I kind of honestly prefer the Wikipedia term for this, which is critical uh, green granules. Um, but we sort of colloquially call them the like green granules of death. Green granules of death. That sounds very and ominous. You see them in patients who are who may die very soon after seeing this, oh. and a lot of them have like liver failure. Oh, um, it's not saying all of them die after finding this, but it is recommended that you call your clinician when you see this. So it's a serious. This is a serious, ominous, like um, ominous finding. The, the bone marrow is stressed because that's a more normal nucleated red cell. See how it's ah uh, okay. So it got out of the marrow too soon, right, before losing the nucleus. Right. So I would say that if you have nucleated red, you should really look for polychromasia because polychromasia is your first left shift stage. Nucleated oh, okay. red is like your next. Oh, okay. And it's like I am really stressed and now I am letting go of my nucleated reds because I just need to get red cells out. I don't need them to mature anymore. Huh. And I want to compare those, those green granules to that inclusion, which is a dolly body. Oh, yeah. You can they do look similar, but this is a lot it. fainter and smaller, huh? Right, and sometimes it can be a little bit more prominent, but it's also more blue. And those are the other ones are supposed to be more blue-green. And honestly, it's probably going to be a little bit stain-dependent. But these are much, much more common. You would expect to see a little bit of toxic granulation. This is actually the same patient from the band that we saw before. Oh, okay. I'm looking for Dolly bodies. Um, and then this is an infant whose mother had this known anomaly and probably also inherited it from her. Hmm. Well, I thought that thing was a big platelet at the it top. It is. Oh, okay. But I don't know what the, in the middle, is it a neutrophil? It's got like little fine granules, but it seems, but the nucleus looks very strange. I don't know what to make of that. So squint a little bit here. Oh, there is a blue blob there. Yeah, there's a little blue. Like a triangle or something. We call that a dolly body like inclusion. In this <laughs> dolly body like inclusion. Because okay. they're ultra structurally not the same thing. Oh, okay. Dolly bodies are um, rough end endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Uh, and they're not exactly the same thing, but they look very. But they look alike on the right. smear. Okay. So this is an autosomally dominant inherited anomaly. It's very heavily board tested. And this is May Heglin. May Heglin. And that you get the giant platelets, platelets. right? And then yep. those little inclusions. Okay. Yeah. And is I mean, this technically isn't quite giant. Oh, yet, yeah, because it's, it's still smaller than a red cell. But right? I mean that's that's it's fairly big, large. Though. Yeah. And so, you know, common things being common in a in a parent that has this known anomaly and a now infant that has this peripheral smear, this is most likely going to be May Heglin. Okay. It's fifty percent chance he was going, the, to he or it. she was going to get. Hmm, I, I'm afraid to say it, but those remind me of is it Downy cells in, or or Epstein Barr virus, something I don't know. It's calling the mind. Several neurons are firing, but they don't know what they're saying. So I probably better be quiet and just let you tell me. Yeah, this is this is Epstein. Virus. Bar virus, bar virus. All right. Something about I'll, the way it merges with its neighbors makes me think of that, but I don't know if that's really what what it means. I just so you kind of got lucky and you picked the exact right virus. <laughs> um, so again, this clinical scenario is going to be important. So if you have the you know the bilateral laryngitis, the lymphadenopathy, all of that, in a teenager, or young adult, or you know, so mono, get, right? Yeah, infectious mononucleosis, not to be confused with monocytes. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. There's different path. monos in heme path. Yeah. Um, but any virus can look like that. Any virus can. And th and this is a, a lymphocyte? These are lymphocytes. They are reactive lymphocytes. They are probably T-cells. Okay. So um, their nucleus looks a little different. They look bigger and more irregular kind of shape than, than your the small little mature, round one. Right, and these way are more activated. cytoplasm. Right. Right. Yeah. These these are like fully functioning, not quiescent. Okay. And you'll notice that it gives way to red blood cells here. It's mm -hmm. a little bit bluer where it's hitting the red cells. Kind of squishes around them, huh? Right. And um, some people call that Dutch skirting. So huh. I Google Dutch skirts, and I don't know what they're talking about, um, because <laughs> I don't see anything that remotely looks like any of that. But they call it Dutch skirting, and 
when I see that, honestly, I'm a little relieved because blasts tend to be bullies and push red cells out of the way. Ah. And your reactive lymphocytes are like, eh, man, I'm busy, like, doing stuff. So they're just kind of oozing around. It, okay, so, but otherwise these could get confused with blasts, right? That's the, the risk, if you don't know. This this particular one, probably not. The chromatin's a little bit too mature, but, I mean, it's activated, and the chromatin starts to get a little bit more open. Sometimes you can get prominent nucleoli. It's really sort of frightening sometimes. Uh, there are often, what do we call these, like, plasma cytoid, like, dark blue ones that are also circulating. And what do you call, what is the word, the technical word for... No, you're right. They're downy cells. Downy cells. Okay, yeah. it is. And okay. there's, like, downy one, two, and three, and I don't remember which one of the Roman numerals this one in particular oh, that's is. No problem, but, but, yes, you're right. They're called downy cells. Cool. Mm hmm. I can't tell if that's a neutrophil. It, maybe that has three lobes, and then a, there's a little blob, like a little signet ring-looking thing there, or if it's a EO. I'm not sure what... What it is. That's a nucleated red cell, right? Yes. Okay, I got one thing right. And the yellow one is a I, polychromatic. Oh, cell. yeah, because it's kind of a bluish color, right? And it's right. overlapping with another one here. I wondered what right. that was, but it's just sitting on top of each right. other. So we're in a thick portion of the smear Oh, yeah, because right the now. cells are stacked up, kind right. of, huh? I don't know. What is what is that? It looks like something I should know. That's fungus. Fungus? Whoa, it looks a lot different than, is it like histo or something? Because yes. if it's that small, then histo is one of the only things I would think of. Histoplasma. Yeah. So I don't, I don't speciate well, sure, ever right. on anything. I will, however, in the area I live, knowing what is available, when I've talked to clinicians, I will tell them I can't say based on morphology. But my gut reaction is that it's probably histo until proven otherwise but you need to do all the appropriate testing yeah i mean you can send blood cultures for fungal sure. cultures but fungal cultures take two weeks and you can't let a person with like that because this is going to be in the marrow yeah it's if it's in, the, in right if it's out in the peripheral blood then surely the it's marrow. in the marrow um yeah because when we see histoplasmosis in durham path oftentimes it's a widespread the patient has either H hiv or some other immune suppressed status or transplant patient so it's all over the place right? right so so they need to treat appropriately so that's not something i'll put in my definitive report it's mm -hmm. just sort of a you, know, you say make, fungal yeast uh in, inside yeah, intracellular of, yeast mm -hmm. present cool that's really fascinating uh, now, keep in mind that you see the crenation here. So this sat a little while uh -huh. before I, I, I got my thing. So some of this crenation is also artifact. Hmm. Yeah, I see the blue, and then I see that bright magenta color there. And then same thing here. I see magenta and then blue around it. I don't, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I, I don't know. What is this? This is... Uh, Plasmodium bivax. Oh, wow. And so this is the gametocyte. Okay. And that's the ring. Form. Oh, the ring. Oh, and okay. Right. Yeah. So I, the but ring you're saying is it's a little... crenated because it sat for uh, a little okay. bit. Uh, it's one of those like, wow, we have malaria and beggars can't quite be choosers uh, yeah. type of a deal. But it's... it's pretty... Plasmodium bivax. So, so malaria, huh? Right. I often don't get to see the gametocyte. So that, that's not a platelet, that's a gametocyte. Yeah, that's why I was like, that That doesn't ring any bells for me. Yeah. And now that you say that, that and the ring I know sense. this is Vivax because the PCR came back as Vivax. I also knew the travel history, and it was 95% Vivax. In the and, region that they went to. Right. Uh, but I will say that your clinicians do not really care. What they care about is, is this falciparum? So Because um, that's the really bad one, right? right. The bad malaria. And this is not something really, as a hematopathologist, you should be like, oh, I'm going to, uh, you probably should get your microbiologist involved um, with that. But important to recognize it on a smear, right? Oh, and know yeah. when to... Because they may or may not have sent for, for parasite analysis. So, like, please send this patient for parasite analysis the next time they're febrile. Yeah. Especially when they're febrile. Because it's only if you would have thought, oh, maybe they have malaria, but if you don't know, if they didn't tell right. you the travel history, if the patient didn't tell you, you know, it's possible they might be clinically, it might not be obvious, right? Right. Or if you know you get peripheral smears from other places and you have no history. Oh, yeah, yeah true. You just, you just don't know. But this gametocyte is not the falciparum gametocyte. Okay. 
And those, yeah, so I've seen those before, like little horseshoes and rings. Yes. And there's more up there, right? Yeah, so this is like the headphone form. Oh, it's or got, headphones, yeah. It's mm -hmm. got the two nuclei. I, I don't know if that's an official term. I like it, though. It works. And then a ring form. And you'll note that there are multiple ring forms in one red blood cell uh -huh. there. And then look at the difference in that gametocyte. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a little bit folded, but you can still see... But it's like a, almost a, a sickle-shaped gametocyte. Like, it's a long kind of oval with a slightly pointy ends. So totally different than that last one, right, which is a totally round. Is this the falciparum? This is the falciparum. Okay. And so uh, the food analogy here is banana-shaped. Oh, banana. That would... Yes, I and can see. It's a banana is, that's folded on yeah. itself. And there's the malarial pig pigment, which is oh. basically hemoglobin breakdown. Interesting. Oh, wow. Compared to this one. So there's a whole bunch of organisms here in the same yep. same cell. And this patient did not travel outside the U.S. Is I want to say like anaplasma or something or or, lich, or lichiosis. Or no, I, but no. I will show you that one. Okay, it's been a long time as you can tell since I've thought about. Maybe I should have studied before making this video. Uh, no, this is more fun. Okay. <laughs> So there are some some things here I want to point out. There are ring forms outside the red cell, which oh, you don't okay. really see in malaria. And there's this structure, which is either called a tetrad oh, yeah, or so a, a little, Maltese cross. Like a cross, right. I can see that. Okay. And this is actually a tick-borne uh, parasitic infection. Hmm. And this is Babesia microbi. Babes yes, yes. I feel stupid because I actually saw a case of that in training and actually have a, a slide of the smear, but I've forgotten, so... Clearly time to refresh my memory. Okay. Babesia. I mean, I don't diagnose dysplastic nevi or melanoma on purpose, so. <laughs> there you go. Hmm. So that's a big blue blob in the cytoplasm of, uh, I can't tell if it's a, is it a neutrophil that's, because it looks like it has tiny little granules here. Yeah, it's either, it's either almost segmenting or a, a band but yeah oh, it's okay. a neutrophil okay and it's not a monocyte which is important right because it's got granules and it doesn't have little vacuoles um hmm, i don't know what that is though so there's the test answer and then there's going to be the real life real life answer okay so if you see this on a test this is anaplasma phagocytophilum oh uh because if you saw it in a monocyte you would pick uh Ehrlichia trapeziensis. Ehrlichia is in monocytes. Anaplasma is in neutrophils. neutrophils. Ah. Now here's the real life answer. This is actually Ehrlichia vingii. It's usually a canine Ehrlichiosis, but we've had at least a couple uh, cases in our geographic area. Wow. Do you have to use molecular to sort out the species? PCR. Or? PCR. Okay. PCR. Wow, that's cool. Not for the patient. I mean, though. no. Yes. Of <laughs> because course. that's that's one of those like you're calling emergency. Calls. Oh, really? It's a real it's, bad... It's really, really yeah, bad. Yeah, it's one of those diseases I don't really have a good concept of like what it entails clinically. I don't, I don't recall ever seeing a patient with it. I, I mean, I'm literally dropping everything at that point. Wow. I'm finding a clinician to call and getting them. Well, that's good. And, you know, see, so that'd be something so easy to overlook, right, if you didn't know to look for it. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's that was not my first rodeo, so I saw that and I knew what I was looking at. And the first one I saw also ended up not being anaplasma. It ended up being Ehrlichia wingii. So sometimes the diseases don't read the books, right? Right. All right. Hmm. I feel like these are uh, mostly lymphocytes, probably. They're round and dark nuclei, and they've got a little tiny rim of blue cytoplasm. And there seem like there are more lymphocytes than there should be from what we've seen on the previous ones. So when I see that, I would wonder about, like, maybe CLL, SLL? And you're saying that because there's a smudge cell here. Oh, is that? I actually... That, oh, okay. I didn't actually know that, but now that you say it, I do remember hearing. I just thought when I see an increased number of lymphocytes that look like small, normalish lymphocytes, I always think, oh, CLLSL. Plus, it's really common, right? So, right. This is a trap. Oh. I'm sorry. I trapped you on purpose uh, because <laughs> not all smudge cells are CLL. On a test, you see small, mature lymphocytes and smudge cells. You pick CLLSL and move on. Um, I honestly have seen more smudge cells with viral illnesses. Oh. This is neither one of those two things. Oh, okay. So here's a higher power picture. This is a small lymphocyte. This chromatin is mature. It's got the thin rim of cytoplasm. But look at that blue compared to this blue. Different color for sure. It's, this is a darker blue. There is 
a nucleolus here that's sort of faint, but you can see But yeah, it. it's like a darker color of the chromatin in the middle. Okay. And then you have sort of a roundish but slightly irregular nuclear contour. No owl rods. This is actually the ALL. ALL. So, well, and that is before the 2000. We still use BALL sort of colloquially. So that's but, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Yeah, it's leukemia. B lymphoblastic leukemia slash lymphoma. Oh, okay. Is the technical now... Uh, classification but it was the entity formerly known as, as ALL, ALL right right okay. and it's so much easier to say it that way. I think it's going to be a long time before that name dies out because it's been around for so long I don't right? think it ever will because it's less of a mouthful and when you're telling patients and families what it is you know which one are they going to remember yes and now wait, is this uh, an hour rod here? It is an hour rod. So is this uh, a myeloid leukemia then? Well, and, maybe. And yes, that is also the test answer. Uh, my world was shattered a few months ago when I read that some B ALLs have hour rod like inclusions. And wow. I went in a corner and cried a little bit because yeah. that was like the one certainty I felt like I had is that if you saw an hour rod, you had some sort of you know, acute myeloid leukemia. So you're, um, so be careful. So the point is, is that this cell right here is a lymphoid blast mm -hmm. and this cell here is a myeloid blast, but it could be easy to confuse those. Especially. Oh, absolutely. And you sometimes get uh, lymphoid blasts that look exactly like that, usually minus the owl rod. Uh, morphologically, it's not a really good way to go. I used to tell residents, uh, if you saw an owl rod, you could call like acute myeloid leukemia and now feel like I can't tell them that anymore but I, common things being common it's most likely going to be acute myeloid leukemia. I feel the same in all parts of pathology anytime there's a rule that I'm like this always works eventually I will see something or someone will publish a paper that makes it like well this always works almost always but then every once in a while there's a rare exception right eventually all the yeah. rules get broken in in medicine I think so the next step if you see well I guess you're okay. gonna tell me okay so uh, there's a lot more white cells so than there should be. Exactly. And they're huge. They're and way bigger than the red cells. Right. So there's a what we call leukocytosis, so leukocytosis. increase in the white blood cell count. Ooh. Um, I think uh, those are blasts, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, maybe they're, they've got little blebs coming off the cytoplasma. I can't remember if that means something or not. There, there's also this like kind of orangey color in the cytoplasm here, like little strands of orange stuff, but I don't know if that's meaningful. So those are a bunch of owl rods. Oh, they're a bunch of owl rods. Oh. A bunch of owl rods. And so then, yes, probably meaningful. Look at how there's sort of this bilobed appearance. I was going to say, is it, it monocytic? Is this is this stuff monocytic? It's not. No. Okay. Um, so I learned it as cottage loaf. And cottage loaf. It's a, it's a British bread. So if you watch the Great British Baking Show, I've they actually it made it okay. once. And I was so excited because every time I say cottage loaf, people look at me like I'm crazy. But it's the term my mentor used, and I actually love it better than bilobed or like hourglass or any of those because it often is bigger at one end than the other. See how that's a uh -huh. bigger? And that's what they do with this bread is they have a bigger ball on the bottom and they have a smaller ball on top and then they stick their finger through to connect them. If you're um, watching this video, please go and find that Great British Baking Show episode and put a link to the Cottage Loaf episode down below. The first person to do it, I won't give you any prize, but I'll give you a special bonus point in my heart. Um, that would actually be fun is to have people go and see how many of the analogies that we have here and they can put videos below. So feel free to do that if you like. It'll enrich the, the video experience for everyone. So this again is, is sort of an important Finding. So okay. this is now all I can think about is how much I want to eat some cottage loaf. I'm not sure what it tastes like, but bread sounds real good. I'm hungry. I've actually made it before. It is actually pretty good. I want a piece next time you do it. All right. Uh, this is APL. And, APL. Oh. Uh, so acute promyelocytic leukemia. And those, this is the really important one, right? This is the really important one, but this is a variant of it. Oh. A specific, less common variant. So normally with acute promyelocytic leukemia, you have pancytopenia and like rare, and I'm going to call them blasts. I know they are technically atypical promyelocytes, but I'm going to consider them to be blast equivalents for simplicity. Okay. You've got very few circulating 
blasts in, and you're like looking and especially at the um, edge of the smear because that's where they... I don't so know you really have to hunt for them, You're huh? hunting for them and you're really looking for this cell here, those cells with lots of owl rods because that's going to make you think, oh my gosh, I really, really need to call people and rule out acute promyelocytic leukemia. This is the microgranular microgranular variant. And I prefer microgranular to hypogranular because if you look at it under electron microscopy, the granules are actually there. You They're just, just really tiny. You just can't see them oh, under cool. light microscopy. Um, and are these, this is the one that you can treat with transretinoic acid, right? Atra. Atra. And they get better basically, right? They are If you have, usually. usually. So there are variant translocations and ah. some of them don't respond to Atra. But if you have the classic 1517 translocation, uh, they respond very well to Atra. So a APL is sort of one of those things of it, where pathology is really important because if you can get the patient through the first two weeks of treatment, they do extraordinarily well. Wow. Like there are almost, I, I can't think of any APL patient I've had that has relapsed. That's or, amazing. So they do extraordinarily well. But then they're the ones that come in and they're already in DIC or they already have brain bleeding. And oh, and they get coagulopathic problems the, with this disease too? Is that right? The granules. Oh, okay. There's tissue factor in those granules. Oh, okay. Now this is all coming back to me now very slowly. And so, um, so basically they either die right when you diagnose them oh. or they do exceedingly well. So it can go and either way. And not a lot huh? in the middle. Wow. So it, it's really one of the, so these, these, these are, are the urgent ones, phone calls. These are the ones this. that will bring me up at two in the morning to look. Wow. And bring my flow tech in for overtime payment and all that other good stuff. Because it matters right away. It okay. matters right away. And it, and they have a, a pretty specific flow immunophenotype that can help. Okay. Um, and I say pretty specific because there is something that can mimic, but really like fish and PCR for 1517 or uh, just a raw, raw translocation is going to be your diagnostic. Okay. That is the peripheral blood of someone who has the more classic APL. Okay. And it kind of has that same bilo, you know, cottage look ish nucleus, but see the granules? Yeah. Lots of granules. And... I mean, this is not really a great picture, but is like one of the only cells that is in the peripheral smear, which is why it's there. Wow. Okay. Hmm. The chromatin on those white cells looks, I don't know, spongy. I don't know if that's the right word, but it looks like it's got little tiny white holes in it. And then there's there are some tiny pink granules, I think, in that blue cytoplasm. I see some granules there. Um... And I feel like that's like got a fold, it does have a fold in yes. the middle. So I can't remember if this is, again, it makes me think of something like blasts, but I, my, my knowledge of blasts is very generic and I'm just like, oh, anything that's weird in a white cell, then I think it could be a blast, but I don't admit it. So I personally would call blue, that a blast. These are probably your pro-monocytes. Pro-monocytes. They're considered okay. to be blast equivalents, so they are. Oh, Okay. But they're a little bit more they're mature. Blast, well, they're blast equivalents in what this is, which is myeloid leukemia with monocytic depletion. Oh, what used to be acute myelomonocytic leukemia, well, or is it, it different? It, it can be either myelomonocytic or it can be acute monocytic. Okay. So if you have two different blast populations, one that is more myeloid and one that is monocytic, or I mean, that's generally how it happens. You mm -hmm. have myelomonocytic, and then you can have just pure monocytic. But either way, it's a... Uh, sub subcategory of acute myeloid, myeloid leukemia. leukemia. Right. So in Dermpath, th these are the ones that we tend to see showing up as leukemia acutus, right? Because the, uh, the particularly the ones that have the monocytic uh, differentiation, either myelomonocytic or monocytic, they for some reason home into the skin. It seems right. like, and they love to come to the dermis. And, and so you're a little bit biased on what you see because totally. even if <laughs> even if you have myelomonocytic leukemia, it's the monocytic component that, that usually, comes to the right. Uh -huh. And this makes sense sort of biologically because what to do. They, they travel, turn into histiocytes, right? Yeah, and they, they get travel into in the peripheral blood yeah. for two days and then they get into places. So your monocytic ones are more likely also to be in your CSF. Oh, okay. So they're equipped so, to do the same things that normal monocytes and, and macrophages and histiocytes do. I mean, do, they don't function normally, but, but they seem to have that ability to get out of vessels and go into exactly. tissues, huh? 
Interesting. And, and this is really going to be your differential for your microgranular APL. Because remember, you were like, uh -huh. is this monocytic? Because, yeah, there's the granules there, and there's not really good vacuoles, are there? No, there can be. And so everybody's blasts look a little bit different. Oh, okay. I mean, I don't think I've really seen two blasts that look exactly the same. So something you can do is, like, pull previous pathology and compare blasts to blasts. And is this what you mean by, so the, the, the blue color here, that real deep blue, is that helpful or just, just pretty to look at? I'm like, I, I don't understand. That's usually your immature cells are that deep, deep blue. Okay. And the only real exception to that are plasma cells that also oh, get yes. blue again. But mostly your immature cells are the ones that are going to have that deep, deep blue cytoplasm. And, and this these is... have more of that blue gray uh -huh. cytoplasm. Yeah. But they're not as mature as I would like that that nuclear chromatin to be to call like a okay monocyte. this one's getting there this one you could almost and i wouldn't really blame you for calling it an atypical monocyte i would call that a pro monocyte <laughs> okay and how do you tell though that this is uh, i mean i can look at that and i say i think that may be a blast but as opposed to like the downy cell earlier the reactive thing is this what you mean by being a bully it's not at all yielding to the red cells it's just perfectly yeah, it's, round and pushing them out of the way exactly okay it's pushing them out of the way that can be sort of a soft sign now okay. i i have seen blasts that have not quite been bullies like they're like okay. nicer blasts to the red cells um but it's sort of one of those soft signs you can sort of help yourself and again clinical information is going mm -hmm. to be key because if you have a kid that has all the mono symptoms you know, infectious mononucleosis you're going to be a little less scared than oh i have this 80 year old who's coming in with you know leukocytosis anemia and thrombocytopenia that to me is and what else helps you here? Is it something about the chromatin, the shape of the nucleus, the size, uh, to, or just the fact that it's a white cell that doesn't look like any of the normal ones? Well, I, mean, all, I know that's really of, simple and basic, but I just wonder, like, what what things that help all of you? the above. So okay. this cell here, because uh -huh. and this cell here, I mean, that's a really like oddly shaped nucleolus. Yeah. Um, and nucleoli are seen in cells that are either immature mm -hmm. or cells that are activated. So remember those. Reactive lymphocytes oh, yeah. can have that. So for white cells in the blood, you shouldn't normally see nucleoli. You, in... you can in really reactive lymphocytes. Oh, okay. But, that's... Um, but it's something that you're like paying attention for. Okay. Oh, if there's a nucleolus here. Maybe I should look at it a little bit harder. That's good to know. Because then... in other tissues, sometimes nucleoli are like normal, right? We see outside of the blood. Do you see how this is a little bit more violet and this is a little bit more purple? I know that's dumb hmm, sounding. Maybe. I... That's how I started to look at the chromatin patterns and okay. how I recognize more open is I felt like that looked like a slightly different shade of purple than this. Okay. And even this compared to this. No, so, I can see that there are color differences. Yeah. So as I said, I think this one is the most mature out of okay. all of them. Um, this one, you know, is still immature, but is more mature than this. And that's partly because of this, you know, cytoplasm. And it's slightly because this chromatin pattern to me looks different. Now, so it's got like pale areas in here. Is that? It's just more open. open. And we call that vesicular. It's just a oh, little okay. bit Yeah, there's, open. there's spaces that are kind of pale. Sure. Yeah. Um, now, I will tell you that when my mentor started telling me that the cells had different chromatin patterns, I thought she was crazy. Well, that's why I'm asking you because I think it's easy for all of us as pathologists. We get used to looking and recognizing once you see something enough, you're like, that's just what it is. But it's always hard, I think, to explain, and I have to think through a lot how to explain what I'm actually looking at when very junior trainees sit with me and they're like, how do you know it's a melanocyte or a whatever? And I have to think through what are the exact features that my mind's picking up on? And it's sometimes hard to verbalize, I think. It, it, I will tell you, it took me years for it to actually like hit and, like, I don't know, like, there was one day that there was sort of, a, like, a light switch moment. But, honestly, she would sit at me with the scope and be like, is this a reactive lymphocyte or a monocyte? And I Oh, really, that's priceless. I mean, I think I that mean, experience of again and again back and forth is when you finally pick up the nuance. So if you're watching this, dear, dear viewer, um, and you're like, those all look the same, don't feel bad because I'm in the same boat as you. I just need to sit with Dr. Ramos a lot more clearly. Um, well, and to be fair, they are all similar. I probably would count them all in the same category. Oh, point. okay. Um, cause again, promonocytes are blast equivalents. So, you, so seeing any of these in the blood is a problem, right? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Cause even if this is an atypical monocyte and, and not a pro monocyte anymore, it's still atypical. Uh huh. Um, and it shouldn't be there. And it right? shouldn't be there. Okay. Hmm. 
So those remind me a little bit of the downy cells, but I noticed that they're pushing, they're not doing the Dutch skirt merging around, they're pushing things out of the way. So I wondered if maybe they're like lymphoid blasts, but you're going to tell me they're something totally different. So honestly, when I would look at that, my gut reaction would be like circulating lymphoma cells. Oh, lymphoma. Okay. But they are AML blasts. AML blasts. Okay. Which is part of my everybody's blasts look different yeah. feel. Because those are AML blasts, and that is a circulating lymphoma cell. Oh, wow. And so it is merging around its neighbors, but that doesn't matter. It's actually lymphoma in this case. Yeah, and look at that nucleolus. Yeah. And then, again, sort of when you get your diffuse large B cell, which this happens diffuse to be, large B. Uh, you can get that blue back in the cytoplasm. So hmm. circulating lymphoma cells can mimic blasts. It's one of the reasons why I am really reluctant to call blasts outright until I have flow okay. because I've seen lymphoma cells mimic blasts and vice versa. I've even seen plasma cells that I thought were blasts and then um, and then the person who who did the workup was like an experience like a really, uh, really experienced somatopathology. He started off with the blast screen, then he did a lymphoma screen, and then he finally added the plasma cell and they were plasma cells. Is the patient had myeloma? The patient had well plasma cell or leukemia. Plasma cell leukemia. And and then yeah, myeloma. But and, as you've taught me, one of the one of the many things I've learned from you in the years we've worked together is that plasma cell neoplastic processes can look wild and crazy and weird and plasma cells when they're neoplastic or dyscrasia, whatever, they don't necessarily look like regular plasma cells. And I've seen ones that look like high-grade lymphomas or blasts in skin, and then you were like, well, I think it could be plasma cells, and sure enough, it was. So that really opened my eyes. I was blown away by that. Yeah. So I think that um, plasma cell neoplasms are sort of like the melanoma of the heme path world. They look they like, like anything. anything. So, so the point is this person probably had a, a large B-cell lymphoma like in a lymph node or a tissue somewhere, and then some of those cells got in the blood and floated around, right? right? And then the tech probably turned this in for blasts. Yeah, because if you didn't know the history, you would think it's a blast, right? Absolutely. Or huh. the, the other thing you have to consider is that patients that have a history of lymphoma and then get chemotherapy can either have recurrence of their disease or can get a therapy-related myeloid neoplasm. Oh. So it could technically also be a blast, which is why I hold off for... Flow. And let me ask you, I'm sorry for diverting again, but nucleoli, the, the, you know, I think in on H&E stain, nucleoli are often like kind of a purpley red color. But here, this is like a circle that's kind of high, less pigmented, like paler than the rest of the nucleus, right? Yeah. And so, but but I think some of the ones we showed earlier, they look darker. But anytime you have like a little circular Circle. area of, of different color in the nucleus, that's probably a nucleolus, huh? If it's like distinct like that. Okay, yes. cool. That's helpful. Hmm. Well, I feel like we've got a, a regular neutrophil there. Mm -hmm. I can't tell if that's regular and just folded funny or if it's a band maybe. That looks like something abnormal. I don't know what those are. That looks like an EO maybe. Um, we'll see how wrong I am in a minute. And those I think are kind of in blasty or in the blasty type lineage, but I kind of wonder if if they're at different levels of maturation, like, cause they all look kind of different from each other. All right. So now it, tell me how bad I failed. <laughs> so that's a basophil. Oh, I and that's what the, the granular basophil looks granular like. So remember basophil. the ba the basophil I showed you before, like, you know, Only I looked a at few... it cross side a yes. little bit degranulated. So that's more of a purple. Okay. Then that, the, that barbie pink, uh, yeah. Neutrophil probably either a, I would say seg because I can see there's a little yeah, okay. there. That's just a funny fold. Okay. Um, myelocyte, 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 uh, either a meta or a myelocyte. It's sort of got that dawning of neutrophilia. So. Oh, I remember hearing that a long time ago. And then that's a blast. A blast. So they are kind of, they're all myeloid precursor cells at different stages. Yeah. So what is this? So then does that mean this person has chronic myeloid leukemia, CML? Yeah. Because you CML. get a range. You don't have enough blasts, right? But, but And you have different levels of maturation. Okay. Right. And this ended up being chronic phase. So there were less than 5% total blasts in the cool. blood. blood. Uh, so I say that, that CML sort of looks like the bone marrow has hit the peripheral blood a little ah. bit. Because you have all the stages of maturation. You'll all often see a myelocyte bulge. Again, I was like, myelocyte, 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 myelocyte. Oh, I see. And then you get a basophilia. And you often will also get an absolute eosinophilia. Okay. But CML, again, can be, you know, can 
percent variable. A lot of different ways, yeah. You can even just get a thrombocytosis. So the real way to diagnose CML is to do the 922 translocation test. Okay. So you're uh, BCR able. And these myelocytes, did, can they look a little bit like monocytes? Or I guess monocytes have the like a more of a... Yeah. So if you look really, really closely, so these are young monocytes because they've got that blue tinge still. Wait, they're monocytes or they're myelocytes? Oh, sorry, sorry, myelocytes. Oh, okay. Uh, they're... They're young myelocytes because they have a little bit of that blue tinge uh -huh. yet. They're they're getting their their secondary granules. Oh, okay, I see. So they've transitioned from the promyelocyte stage where they only had primary granules, and now they're getting their secondary granules. Okay. Um, this is a little bit of an older myelocyte, and you can see that it's cytoplasm pinky, right? yeah. looks mm -hmm. more like the neutrophil. Okay. They're still myelocytes. Okay, cool. Just, you know, in the book, it looks like things go from here and then jump to here. And then jump to here. But they and it's actually really slowly like a evolve. Spectrum. Huh? I personally like to give things the benefit of the doubt. And if it's sort of an, a tweener, I give it the benefit of maturity. Oh, okay. That's helpful. That's and, good to know. Uh, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just what I do consistently. I and think. And so you should be just consistent in what, and know what you're going to do and why. I love that you said that. I think in, all, in my areas too, when I teach, I say the same thing. I don't necessarily know if this is the best or right way to handle it. This is just how I do it. And I try to do it that same way every time. And I think that's what a lot of times people want to know. Like people who, you know, you see this all day long and you found a way to handle something practically. And that's the hardest part sometimes with pathology is knowing how to practically work through things. Mm, there's lots of white cells here and they all look different shapes and sizes. It's important to know that this is a two-year-old. Oh, yeah. Um, I see vacuoles here. Mm -hmm. I think that might be a monocyte, but you are not saying any noises here. You're, you're I'm letting getting you talk. a good poker face. I see little granules here. I don't know for sure what that means. You're pointing at that. I wonder, I seem to remember that kids with maybe Down syndrome get something unusual where they get lots of white cells that gets confused with leukemia, but I totally can't remember what that is anymore. So that is but true just and guessing. exists. Um, but that's normally in the newborns. Newborns, stage. okay. So that's uh, called transient abnormal myelopoiesis. Okay. And that usually goes away. And and usually, again, happens in the first few months of okay. life. Okay, not in a two-year-old. And it's important to know that that happens uh, be in those patients because they have a 20% more risk of getting the leukemia at age two. Okay. So it might come back as leukemia. Oh, okay. That's good to um, know. I didn't know that. It, it doesn't, you, you don't have to have TAM to have the leukemia, the transient abnormal myelopoiesis. Uh, but if you have that, you may have a higher. But you might, you have a higher risk of, of getting the leukemia. So it'll probably watch a little bit more closely. Okay. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. I feel like, and maybe this is a, maybe an, that's EO? an EO. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm impressed by all the various shapes and sizes. I, I don't understand what. We'll talk. About, but let's compare that EO. See uh -huh. that pink? Yeah. To that purple. Oh yeah, that is more purple. I see what you're saying. Okay. Okay. So this is a blast. Okay. These are abnormal monocytes. Okay. Monocyte, monocyte, monocyte. Probably a monocyte, monocyte may even be another blast up okay. there. This is actually JMML, so juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia. Okay. Um, it is normally seen in about age two. It okay. can be associated with neurofibromatosis type one. Oh, that's right. Which that's is the right. only reason why I gave an age with this one, because it's important to know, to know. the age for this diagnosis. Uh, those to me look like, okay, now, okay. These look like mature lymphocytes, I think, but there are too many of them. And these are smudge cells. So unless you're tricking again, CLL, SLL, CLL. okay, chronic lymphocytic chronic, leukemia. Yes. All right. And that's what you pick on a test and you move on. Okay. Hmm. Those have round nuclei with blotchy. Oh, I wonder, are they, could they be plasma cells maybe? I see like a clock face or chocolate chip cookie pattern. I like chocolate chip cookies. So, but blobs of dark in the, the chromatin pattern, like here, little blobs and they're kind of eccentric. They've got cytoplasm out here and maybe a little touch of a perinuclear hawk, like a pale area right there. Is that right? Or is it wrong? No, they're plasma cells. Oh, right. Yeah. 
often I've seen with those circulating plasma cells is that the perinuclear hop is not as prominent as it is. Yeah, it definitely plasma. looks yeah different in tissue. It's really easy to see on I an mean, it's thing. really easy to blow by these if you're at yeah. low power. Um, and yeah, I kind of thought of lymphocytes at first, but they had too much cytoplasm, and then, then I noticed the chromatin looked kind of weird. Right. And so you can have them look like this, and then you can have them look really, really cool. Really amazing how different cells look on a right stain on a smear than in a tissue on H&E. Okay. Hmm. Again, I kind of wonder about a plasma cell, because it's got like a little hoff, and then the chromatin, it's a little harder to see. And then this, I'm not really sure. It's it's a neutrophil. A neutrophil. And I put it here. Oh, is that Rolo? Yeah, that's real Rolo formation. And so that is actually a plasma cell. Um, and that you get in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, or can you get it in any sort of myeloma, the Rolo formation? Oh, yeah, you can get it in, in myeloma. You can also get it with some autoimmune diseases and such. So they're all sticking together, it's, right? Again, Antibodies, like a it? stack of pennies or something. Oh, well, I use M and M's and Rolos. Oh, that sounds delicious <laughs> so, too. You know, multiple myeloma, which we don't really use anymore. Plasma cell myeloma, but plasma cell. but it takes away my my way. So I put the candies together. So M and M, so multiple myeloma, and uh, then you know those Rolos that are the little caramel filled them. chocolates. Yeah, yes, and they exactly. stack up. And and they don't just touch, they stack. Yeah. And that's important. And there's got to be at least four of them. To count. Oh, okay. They have to be stacked and they have to be at least four. So this up here would count one, two, three, four? Yes. Okay. So that's nice, low formation. Okay, cool. Hmm. I, I think that's a giant platelet, huh? Yes. Because I was going to say, I don't even know if that's a nucleus. It doesn't have like a a border around it and it's all like just granules all chunk chunked together and it's the whole thing's bigger than a red cell right and so probably you count it as a red cell instead of oh because on a, a, on the the coulter count the counter like checks by size, size partly right okay yeah oh and these are platelet aggregates right right and Huge these are the clumps. ones so this is the one i told you we talk a little bit more about edta and so yeah so this is an edta artifact mm. and in some patients this happens Wow. And you can recollect in a sodium citrate or light blue top tube okay. and get a platelet count off of that, and that usually will help resolve. Now, is this this seems like more white cells than there should be. Is it because we're at a thick edge of a specimen or I'm something? I'm at the feathered edge Oh, here. okay. Um, like this is where the, the smear comes to an end, huh? Right, yeah. I. So it, the density is higher, huh? I wasn't paying it. I don't know what the white count was oh, in I particular see, yeah. because... You were just trying to get the platelets. I was trying picture. to get the platelets. They may be a little bit higher, but I honestly can't tell. Oh, okay. No, that's fine. That's good to know. Um, because I'm pretty sure this patient would have a thrombocytopenia mm -hmm. by machine. Um, and oh, because all the platelets are all clumped, clumped together, together, so it looks like they're they're lower because... They're right. So your platelet count is going to be inaccurate. Okay. Oh, and that means something. Those are platelets sticking to the outside of a, I think, a neutrophil, right? Yes. Oh, I that I remember that picture from studying for boards, but I can't remember now what it. Does it mean they're covered in um, like antibodies or something like uh, autoimmune? Well, it's platelet. It's platelet satellitism. It's okay. also an EDTA artifact. Oh, it's an artifact. Okay, uh, I just remember seeing it and thinking it was pretty. And then, since they're sticking to the neutrophil, they get counted with the neutrophil. Oh. And so you can also get a spurious thrombocytopenia with platelets. Okay, and I see. you can do the same recollection. Because none of these guys, normally these would get counted as whatever, 10 platelets, but now they'll get not counted at all because you're going through the machine with the neutrophil. Okay. Right. They're hiding out. You know, like. Cool. Uh, that's a little tiny blue guy, and he's got some little speckles in him. So is it a, a reticulocyte? site? Or you said you can't tell that unless you do the special stain, Right. Right. And I want to say there's something else that you can get cells that look like that met hemoglobinemia or I don't remember. Okay, I give up. That's a hypogranular platelet. Hypo oh that's a platelet, okay. It's a platelet. It's a largish platelet. Okay. Um but remember when I showed you the neutrophils that were hypogranular and hyposegmented? This is the platelets in the same patient. Oh, okay. Um, so they also show some dyspoetic findings and are large and hypogranular. Yeah, it's a lot harder to recognize them when they're big and then don't have the. Well, and you can see granules. how this can sort of get confused with those gametocytes. Oh, yeah, sure. That would look a lot like a gametocyte from malaria. Oh, you have a hard job. Uh, <laughs> Okay, those red cells look abnormal, and I'm guessing that's an artifact, but I don't know. 
And there's a bunch of blue in between. The blue in between is what I want you to see. Well, I mean, I'm since we just looked at hypogranular big platelets, I would wonder if it's a bunch of those, but I don't see like any granules at all. I don't know what that is. Those are cryoglobulins. Oh, that's what cryo looks like on a smear. Whoa, that's amazing. Very different than like we see cryo sometimes in skin and it looks like pink, bright pink stuff um, that's filling up blood vessels, kind of like fibrin. Very different than that. Amazing. That's, that's really cool. Um, so the red cells are actually not abnormal. They're just crunched up against this, right? It's just pushing them out of the way and making them look weird. Right. Huh? That's it. Wow. This is really cool. I feel like I've learned a lot of things. I don't know how long I'll retain them, but, uh, thankfully we'll have a video that I can watch again if I need a refresher. And I'm not saying this is like all of peripheral stuff oh, because well. we'd be here. This is why we have fellowships, right? On, to... on end, but there's some interesting things. I think some good tidbits. Cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that knowledge with us. And, um, I will, uh, put some links to uh, social media that um, Dr. Ramos helps contribute to down in the video description and also a link to her uh, lymph node uh, lecture if you haven't seen that yet. I highly recommend it. It's fantastic. And uh, please let us know what you think about the video. Comment down below. And if you want Dr. Ramos to come back again for third or even more uh, visits uh, to give us some heme path knowledge, let us know and let us know what you think uh, she should cover. So thanks again for watching and uh, please uh, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel um, if you want to be notified of more videos like this. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Ramos. Thank you.